Hello and welcome to the show. This is Do All The Things. On today's episode, well, I've been working on a little bit of a prototype here because this is my living room gaming PC and I've uh, set up a configuration here where I can uh, turn it on remotely. And then once I get that wired in there, I wanna finally water cool it, the CPU at least. Stay tuned. So if you've been following the comedy, you might be aware that I uh, built up this uh, PC for my living room for gaming because I don't game down in my office anymore on my big system. Don't need to. This pupper right here, 5800X3D, 32 gigs of 3600CL, what was it again? 16, 16, 16, 36? Having to remember all these numbers, bro. And then it uses a 6950 XT for graphics, solid gaming rig, but it is in the living room. And you know, sometimes you, you sit down on that chair there, you want to turn it on and off remotely. Now I bought this little device here many, 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 many years ago for one of the last iterations of my living room PC. I've got these cables rigged up here. They're kind of like, you know, the motherboard jumpers. They're on some specific spots on the motherboard to tap into power and button signal. And then I just have this little module. And then if I press the button, well, okay, look at the light here because I haven't got it framed up. Clicky, clicky button press and then the computer turns off now. So it was just a little kit from eBay. It's got a wireless remote. The B button doesn't do anything and it just has this circuit board here. Now, just to draw a quick and dirty representation of how this works, it runs off five volts. So that's a good compatible computer voltage. And you have a five volt input and a ground input. And then you have the microcontroller with the freaking wireless antenna. I think you would draw that like this. And then that microcontroller obviously gets power off there. But so this isn't a normal relay. How it works is it, it has a MOSFET control, uh, an N-channel MOSFET on the ground bus, which essentially functions as a momentary push push button that the MCU controls. So the MCU is going to put, press this button when you click the, the remote button, and then that's just going to pass ground. There's always going to be five volts on the output. Now, this is kind of counterintuitive to how you would expect a, a relay module like this to work, but it works in this case. I had a hunch on how the power button on a motherboard works. Now, if you look here at the pinout of the Crosshair uh, VIII, so that's five, six, seven, eight. It's the Crosshair eight. I keep forgetting that number. The power button pinout, it doesn't really tell you what's going on here, but it's not a positive signal. So this second pin here is a ground pin. It's connected to power negative. And then this pin here is essentially just a trigger pin that when you ground it out, it tells the computer to turn on. So that would be a logic low signal. Grounding signals for triggering stuff is very common in computer. It's a safer way to do it because, well, logic low will trigger a P-channel transistor or MOSFET, which will switch positive. It's also a safe bet so you don't have positive power, you know, kind of peeking around, poking out where it doesn't belong. Ground is a pretty benign in ways. It, it's safe to just kind of splatter around about. And my hunch is that probably all motherboards work like this. Like, I can't be sure. I can't be sure but I'd imagine most work which is the reason why this schematic works for here because we just ignore this output we have no need for that we put five volts in to power it we have a ground signal and then we just connect the power button to this freaking ground line here and then well that's convenient it just grounds out that pin sends the logic low signal and then it works now I was poking around the eBay to see if I could make some sort of recommendation for if you wanted to do something like this and there's all sorts of options like if we look at this pupper right here, five to 24 volt remote, uh, it, it kind of looks a lot like the one that I have. Only thing is it says uh, self-locking, interlocking, inching. I, I have no idea what that means. You can freely adjust. Does it have like the little button? Cause I've noticed some of these things are multi-mode. This again is momentary. So I press this button and then it's like a little button press. It doesn't latch on, in which case that would just, you know, it'd be like holding your power button, the computer would turn on and turn back off again. Some of these things are somewhat configurable and this suggests all the configurations. Now it says it's adjustable, but it doesn't necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily, necessarily say how to adjust it. Here's another one I was looking at. This one might be more, more practical. It even has a nice plastic box. And then this guy has an actual physical relay. 
And it says you can get a five volt version with one or two remotes. $60 Canadian, 11 US, not exactly breaking the bank from Deerish with 111. So how something like that's gonna work is if it indeed works on five volts, you're gonna have some power input and then you're gonna have your MCU and that MCU is gonna control the relay coil, which is gonna control this switch. And then this switch just has two open contacts, much like the push button that you wired to your computer. So this would be a lot more straightforward to wire for the average Joe than, you know, the more complicated one that I have here. It's not complicated to me, but I have decades of electrical experience under my belt for someone who just like is having at it. I'm guessing these two poles here are gonna be power input. And then this is gonna be your relay control because the relay is actually gonna have a setup like this where there's gonna be a common pin, then there's gonna be a normally closed pin and a normally open pin. So you would want to ignore that one and hook it up to the normally open because it basically you'll have a connection that's always on when you're not pressing the button. And this guy right here has this learning button here, which uh, changes modes. According to the instructions, you can set it to be momentary or toggle. So you press it, it's gonna swap over and stay there. Press it, it's gonna undo. I'm not sure what the default is. It would suck if you unplug the computer and, and the module loses power and then it forgets how it's supposed to work. So I can't give you the best advice. Just be like, oh yeah, buy one of these if you wanna do it. I'm working with what I got that I bought like probably 15 years ago. So I gotta go ahead and start wiring this up. So real quick, how this is gonna work is we're gonna tap power from the USB and then just have one lead that goes to the power button. This in particular case has no USB 2.0 headers. So we could just snap power right from the USB. Maybe I should just use these cables that I conveniently already have ready. Though I don't know if this cable's gonna be long enough to mount this somewhere. Cause that's the other challenge of this, trying to figure out where I'm gonna hide this little pupper. The one idea I'm having is more trouble than it's worth. Okay, no. Gonna cut fresh cable. I got this ribbon cable that came with a kit. Kinda sucks to use it up. It's just two strands there. Zit. So we only need to tap one signal from the power button. So I've taken this ribbon cable, I've mid-stripped it, I've twisted it up, and then I have this Prokevia Precivia kit with DuPont connectors. And I'm gonna need one of these females. And even though this is a lot of shielding, I'm gonna try to mash this shielding a bit thinner and see if I can't get that on there. Pints, make sure that wire's tucked in there nice. Get the crimping tool. Aha, now we have that going on. Then on this other end, I have male connectors. I'm gonna crimp a male connector on this. Yeah. Then I have these single bits here. Toddy freaking da. I'll show you what to do with this guy after. But this one here, need to put some connectors on this end. Now you gotta kind of mind positioning a little bit so that these will go into the connector the way you want them after. Such a handy kit, I'm so glad I bought this kit. All right, I gotta look at the manual and if I scroll up a bit, we're gonna come to the USB connections. You're gonna see five volt USB and USB is almost always putting out power. Then we have ground and not connected, but the top of this header is five pins. So obviously this comes with the little other parts. I gotta configure this to be face up. So pin one is positive, which is gonna be the white, as is the tradition, and black's gonna be the negative. And I'm keeping with a five pin header to keep in with that same theme. The idea being is if I accidentally plug it in upside down, well then the positive pin's gonna go to NC and then the ground pin's just gonna end up sitting on a data. So there's only, you know, it's gonna be a little bit of reverse polarity protection, but that's generally our wiring harness there and the perspective should be good. Next trick's gonna be wiring it in. So this is the header that comes with the case. It's an all-in-one header. As you can see, it's oriented the same way too with the exposed contacts upwards. That third one, which is this one right here, is the one that we need to get out. Just jam something in there and, oh, it's a short connector, so I can't really, oh, no, here we go, here we go, pull it out. Then on our wiring harness, we're gonna take our duplicator here. We're gonna pop that in there. Base is a bit thick because we got double insulation. Gonna take a little quaxing to get it all up in there. There it is. Boom, there we go. Now that goes to the existing power switch. We're gonna stick one of our little puppers on here like that. And then we just have this little coupling like that. And boom, we got the existing power switch. That'll plug on to the existing uh, motherboard header. This'll reach over just a little bit more to a USB header to get power and then boom. Now I just have to figure out how much length we need of this and solder our controller onto it. So I'll just go ahead and fish this complement through the back. 
Figure we want at least that much slack. On the back of the case, I'm figuring it's gonna hang out up here somewhere. So we will kind of go like that. Da, da, da. We'll give ourselves that much. So I'll just snip these in particular colors that I'm keeping. Come on now. Need a little bit more just like that. And then this is gonna just pull right off. Whee! And the rest of this ribbon cable comes loose. A couple stretches less on it. This ribbon cable came with the kit. We're done with the kit now. Now it's just a case of wiring up on this. Got the old heat iron ready to go. Got to pull out these old wires from how it was implemented before. Gonna have to clean out these holes if we can. Can't quite get the right angle here. Need to flip her around. Okay, so we got our wiring harness. So we got V negative, V positive. Oh, this lines up perfectly, bud. The gray is the signal that's going to go to P negative on this particular unit. And if you have a similar unit. And then white's positive. There's a V plus. And then black's negative, where there's a V minus. Now, to the best of my knowledge, you can pretty much pull ground from anywhere. There might be some impedance on that connection. It might not be directly connected to ground to prevent any short circuit conditions from doing damage. So they might have something like a 100 ohm resistor on there. You just need a little bit of ground signal. When it comes to logic level, it's so low in the microamps, even a pretty high impedance resistor like a 1K is gonna be completely transparent. So ideally, I'd want to do something like that for this kind of a rig. But as long as we don't make any mistakes, it should always be fine. But that should be ready to go now. So if I turn on the power, this should have power. And then it should just be... Oh, it helps if I plug in the connections. So we got to get this back on front panel just the way it was before. Oh, I don't like this comes over instead of under. Uh, so my cable management's slightly compromised, but well, let's face it, my cable management's always compromised on my own systems. This one goes on to USB power. So then, now, ha there it goes. I also rewired this case so that that's the power light, which was normally the hard drive light, and this big fancy thing is the hard drive light. I prefer, I like doing that to the cases. I like making the big light the blinker. Now I know the remote works, but in theory, well, we give it a minute. It's got a boot and stuff. We're torturing this poor system right now. But the uh, manual button should still work just fine. We don't want to be bypassing that just in case the batteries die. Yeah, there it goes. Okay, so we just got to find a tucky spot for this now. I think it's just going to be generally in here. The only thing is this guy's rather exposed. Digging around my junk pile, I got these little tiny battery boxes that I don't particularly care much about. You buy those LED lighting kits for your car, they come with like a stack of little coin cells in here to make it all 12 volt like. This does pose a conundrum though. Not that big of a conundrum. I just have to repeat a little bit of my work. Okay, so I just, you know, I had to unsolder it so that I could put the wires through the hole of the box. And it's convenient that the little, you know, I could just kind of pack it in there. And then there's just the perfect amount of room for the coil. And it just pips over there. And then boom, look at that. That's great, because now we can just kind of like thread this needle up here, um, go in here, just, just chuck it in here. Just chuck it in here, loose all, there's a cavity up here in the top. You just jam it up in there. Yeah, let's make sure it still works. It's the only thing, you know, you're putting in a little uh, shielded enclosure there. No, it's gonna be fine. And one of the beauties of that thing now, the way I've been able to properly wire it up with its little kit is I can easily migrate it over to any computer I want in the future. Now there's one other thing that I, I almost forgot that I had planned for this system. That's uh, to do with this little pupper right here, the SN 750 500 gig. I could be swapping that out with an SN 850 one terabyte. It's like that one terabyte was chosen with gaming in mind. So on the system that I'm not gaming on, it doesn't make sense. So I've pulled it out of my main rig. I temporarily in my main rig migrated the OS over to uh, a 256 gig Gen 1 Western Digital, like Gen 1 Black, OG. It was competitive with the Samsung 960 Evo of the time, if I do recall. I haven't even noticed. I haven't even noticed with that 256. I just used that computer for editing. I'm hoping that, um, 850 is gonna take a little bit of edge off my game load times. But now we use the workshop system for what the workshop system was designed to be used for. I gotta reach into here. Ah, that one slot is just not as accessible anymore. I can still get at it though. 
That should do it. Load up the old Paragon hard disk manager. They're all showing up now. That's the Intel drive. There's the 500, there's the 1T. 500 is our current install. The 1T is our old one. Just gotta go delete all these partitions. Paragon's tricky. If there's no label, you have to type no label. Even if it doesn't tell you no label. All right, that 1T is flushed out now. Now I wanna have a think to make sure, yeah. Migrate OS is the function. If we have um, UEFI, used to be you could just do a raw copy, but not since UEFI, you have to do this migrate. So select an OS to migrate, that's the one here on the 465, and the target is gonna be the 1T. Next, use all available space, create new EFI boot partition, copy, finish, and then now it's not gonna do anything. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I'm second guessing myself. That was definitely the 500, apply. Now, hopefully with NVMe, it's not gonna take very long. Well, that's happening. Water blocks. 